And Nogao has been there for a long time. I mean, there are various other pressures also. So these two things, I think, will take care of development and uh, conservation both. Thank you. So see, everything at the end of the day, it's umbilically connected. I mean, it's almost, it's really cliched, but uh, Bibhuti, um, you know, you're, you're in another hot spot. I mean, if you look at what he's doing, he lives in the land of the Golden Langur, he lives in the land of the Rhino, and he's in Manas. <coughs> But he also lives in a land where all the flashpoints we've been talking about in terms of <coughs> internal security, in terms of separatism, in terms of actual killings and, and, and tensions. How, how, how is biodiversity going to survive if we are oxymoronic? Yes, uh, I am remembering your film that you have produced uh, like Mother Art. Yeah. You know, there is a tolerance level up to a certain extent. After this that, is Aranyak, by the way. Yeah. So yeah. if, if mother art hurt, then it will, it will, she will, she yeah. will react. Yeah. And, and as a result of that, although we have so much of development take, taking place, we are not still able to tackle the disaster. So there, I think we need to now already so much of, I, I personally feel we need now time to act, do action. Because we have already lost so many things and there will be development. We, we need to do now action. For example, uh, especially, especially as you mentioned about Manas area, where insurgent, insurgent problem are there, insurgent areas, uh, uh, you know, development is lacking. 84 people, 84 percent of the people are dependent on the on the forest, on on firewood, on grass collection, things like that. Chandan, what? Where do we go? I mean, is there a solution to this whole thing? I mean, you, I, I'm reading about what you're doing and it's remarkable. I mean, immigration, indigeneity, Bangladeshi, immigration tangled in Assam. Look, we're going to get 30 million people moving north from Bangladesh and from the 24 Parganas south. They are going to move. Syria is going to be a teddy bear's picnic. When these people go forward and they start moving north, what are you going to, how are you going to... That's why I think while we are addressing a global problem, uh, the local specificities must be addressed. Uh, and just to complement uh, what Arup has said, this mm -hmm. complex history of you know, the demographic change in Assam and resource use uh, patterns, if we do not understand that, it is very difficult to address the problem at the, at the ground level. You see, uh, uh, you know, we, not only immigration from Bangladesh or or, or migration from other Indian states. You know, we have seen this right from the colonial times and how it led to the complete change of demographic pattern and, uh, you know, resource use patterns. More than that, Assam has, uh, you know, seen this uh, 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 tea plantations, how, how you know, um, uh, the future uh, space for agrarian, expansion of agrarian frontier uh, was not anymore there because of plantations, because it also, you know, uh, uh, uprooted the existing forests. Then we had this 1950 great earthquake, uh, which led to, you know, cataclysmic change in the, uh, in the topography of Assam, making, I mean, compelling people to move to areas which were flood prone <coughs> earlier, um, or to areas which are forested. Because apart from that, there was no land available. On the other hand, in the tea plantations, we have you know, the uh, tea plantation labor who migrated from central India. Now, these people are not peasants when they came here. When they become ex-tea garden labor, when they retire from tea garden, where, do, where would these people go? So they would also settle in areas, especially in the foothill regions. Therefore, we will see that, you know, the entire northern belt, right from, you know, uh, western Assam to up to, you know, Dhamaji, you will see uh, the forest areas are heavily encroached upon. Then we also have, you know, certain other aspects. One is, for example, if I may mention, the political project. You know, for example, that is where Lo local communities, even if they, you empower them, they cannot effectively tackle encroachment. Uh, for example, we have this uh, uh, movement in Assam to create a contiguous territory for an ethnic homeland, you know, which led to destruction of 
forest in many areas of northern belt of uh, you know, Assam. <clears throat> so these are existing problems over and above. You see, now we are also uh, uh, facing the threat of a network of dams planned in Arunachal. So what will be its effect on the livelihood of people, on the existing topography? What will have, what, I mean, what will, what will happen to the existing conservation efforts if that happens? So these are big questions which I think we have to address. Because locally, even theoretically, we may have solutions, but if that happens, then even, you know, uh, I'm happy you mentioned Bhutan, but you know, we are also facing uh, some, you know, adverse effect of, of the released water from Kurishu Dam, right? So uh, what is dubbed as, you know, green in Bhutan may have totally different effects in Assam, which is just in the lower riparian area. So these are certain questions which I think uh, I, I thought I should flag out and uh, we can discuss. Yeah, may, may I just do one thing? And I, I just want Yash to just, just, just weigh in on one thing. He's, he's working at a landscape level. The question I'm posing to all of us over here, and we'll throw this open to questions, and then we can, each of us, field whichever question we wish to answer, is that on a landscape level, when you're going to get from the south moving northward 20 to 30 million people inevitably they have to move your glaciers are melting punjab haryana <laughs> western up is not going to be your breadbasket anymore your coastal areas your aquifers are going to get salinized the government's development plan involves say taking 120 square kilometers of the panna tiger reserve which feeds the the ken river how on a landscape level do you i mean when you're sitting down and working out yash that this is what we'll do, this is what the... Are, are, you, are, you, are you factoring in what's, what nature is planned apart from what uh, the Prime Minister's office has planned? On the one hand, I just feel that uh, nature is... I mean, there was a question you asked earlier where you said, you know, will nature do its own thing? I'm sure it will. But the things that we have done, I think we are all going to pay a very high price uh, for whatever we have done and are doing. At the landscape level, we are trying a lot of things, but as someone working with a conservation organization and in the field of natural resource management, I, in recent years, have been feeling a lot, uh, you know, it's like back to the wall. Um, it, it's, it's, not, it's not easy, the solutions. I mean, I, I want to look at happy stories. I want to look at positives. I want to see things working, but uh, I, I really have, Personally, it's also a lot of sea mentality of siege that, uh, you know, I'm not very certain what all we'll have to do to kind of find that balance again. I'm, I'm extremely worried. Um, and, I, and I see a lot of ethnic tension rising. I see a lot of, uh, you know, interstate things that you talked about. And I really rue the lack of statesmanship and, and the, you know, the I'm, I'm not sure if the leadership, I'm not just talking of political leadership, even local leadership in the communities, are we mature enough to take on those uh, challenges? I really don't know. I, I really, like I said, I want to look at happy stories, but I'm not too sure. I, I don't feel as optimistic. Let's, let's give it to someone yeah. who, when the happy stories are not happy, we come to I, I just want to say a couple of things more, very quickly. <laughs> I also want to talk a bit about aspirations. I think we should make a distinction between, say, the aspirations of about 400 million of us, and, and you started off by saying that, you know, there is a difference in the aspirations that some of us who already enjoy a standard in this country, I'm not talking about the planet at this point of time, but there are a lot of us, and, and a significant number of us who are already living a lifestyle that is as good as any of our, you know, say, North America or Western Europe, Australia, we are already there. And, and I, I worry that, you know, it is this aspiration that is driving a lot of the conservation challenges. It is not the aspiration of the remaining seven to 800 million people uh, who at this point of time still are aspiring to the basics. And, and you know, we keep saying, are there too many of us? But what I worry about is not just that are there too many of us, maybe there are, 
but I worry that the few of us who are already there have aspirations that are far beyond and it's their aspirations that I'm worried about and the conservation challenges that poses rather than the aspiration of the remaining few hundred uh, million Indians. I, I doubt that they are aspiring. Often they are, they are in fact paying the price of the aspiration of these 400 million as well. And I think we should make that distinction between the, the, you know, that aspiration and the larger aspiration of, of a significant minority, but nevertheless a very influential minority of Indians. Uh, and, and, I, and I think, you know, the, the, it also said, is there a silver bullet? I think the silver bullet, I'm not sure, it may not be a silver <laughs> bullet, a magic bullet, or what was it, silver bullet, sorry. But, it, it, <laughs> but it's, it's going to be a, a long, arduous, I think the change will happen when this 400 million realizes that so much and no more. And, and that, that's, where we, that's where it will come. It's not going to be some 1.25 billion who, has, who are going to have to make those changes. It's going to be the 400 million of the haves amongst the Indians who are going to have to make those difficult choices of so much and no more. Can I just leave one question for all the social scientists? Two or three things that you have to take care as far as the Eastern Himalayas are concerned. Today you have people who are staying there and the density of population, especially in the Arunachal or in the fragile areas along the Myanmar border is very, very low. It, it's not very dense. But do you realize because of the security imperatives that are coming up and the forces that we have raised, we're going to be putting in place, just to give you the example of RALP, that is from Along all the way to Kibitu, we used to have 10,000 soldiers, about 15,000 soldiers. We've got another division and a half there. There are 25,000 people or 30,000 people who are non-resident, who are not aware of how to live in that ecological setup in the balance. They are the ones who are going to degrade it the maximum. So I think the problem is there that is very intense. Today you look at the energy requirement of our country. We get 6,500 megawatts of power from Bhutan. Arunachal Pradesh is home to 30,000 megawatts of power. Requirement for India in 2030 is to hit 20,000 megawatts of power. We are going to be looking at these dams coming up across. If Jindal is making a road or it's the JPs, it's coming in. So this is actually going to happen. So please, when you do your uh, mathematics of social scientists, look at this non-resident, non-local population who's now going to occupy this border for the next 30, 40 years and decade till we have problems sorted out. You'll also got the energy which is going to come up. It's going to get taken in. And the third thing is, the aspiration of the lower people is not really the issue at all. So I think when you're looking at this problem, to give an example of Assam, because Lika Bali falls on the border of Assam and Arunachal Pradesh, uh, we've made an army cantonment there. Uh, so I wanted 168 hectares of land for us. It is forest land. And I sent photographs that not even a blade of grass is on that ground. But it's forest land. So I think the audit that we need to do in our country to actually come to the true picture in the Northeast of what is forested and non-forested will actually give you a true picture. Because the solutions you're giving are on statistics which are not correct. The problems are not live. And in the end, which you said, the question that you raised, I think, whatever you might say, I, like in my last appointment, I was looking at 43 con cities and towns where we had solar power, a forest station, using the STP, not using the underground water soil, but using the non-untreated water of the sewage system for greening. All these efforts are being done by the armed forces all across. And today, when you look at the borders across here also, when you go to the cantonments, you'll find that that is happening. So, I think the role for the army, we take it on as a mandate that I am a citizen of this country. If there is a problem, I will have to handle it. So irrespective of whether the mandate comes to me or not, but it is an area which will get more and more involved. I mean, what happened in Uttarakhand, it had to be the central army commander who had to pull out the whole thing from there. So I think we are conscious of the fact, and I think the armed forces, with their being named as the first responders, are quite aware of the fact that when, when the, as I say, when shit hits the ceiling, we'll have to be there to clean it up. <laughs> I don't think there is any other alternative and, uh, for, for people and nature to, co to coexist. And, uh, and I think that's, the, that's really the prevailing opinion among many conservationists I know. And I think we get into these endless debates whether people versus nature are just whether we have to take a pure preservation, uh, conservation approach uh, with fences around the protected areas. I mean, that's not literally true, but you know what I mean. On the one hand, we have positions 
that we have to conserve nature. There are only very, very few wild places left in the world and in India, and they have to be conserved at any cost. And then there's the other view. We have to find a way for nature and humankind to coexist. It has coexisted, of course, for a number of years, for millennia, actually, not a number of years. Of course, the population pressures have increased tremendously during the last many decades. The population of India has what, quadrupled during the last, uh, I would say, 70 years, 60, 70 years. And when you look at it, look at that figure, you know, that the number has increased tremendously four times. Has biodiversity declined four times during that last 60 years, 50 years? I don't think so. And I think if you look at the current rates of uh, devastation of, uh, of forests, I think there, are evi there is evidence that the rates have declined considerably, except except Northeast. And, and I think one of the reasons why the rates have declined at many other places is that gen generally the rate of degradation of forest is also very much correlated with the amount of forest. And I think many places the amount of forest has in decreased tremendously and as a result the rates have also come, come down. But I think in the Northeast the amount of forest relatively speaking, remains very large, so the rates are high. But I think we have opportunities, and, uh, and, and I think what worries me is, uh, uh, you mentioned the climate change issue. When you look at the climate change, and India has made some commitments in, in Paris uh, as to how they are going to sequester more carbon, and when you look at those figures, and we have done the analysis recently, and the paper just came out this week, uh, those figures are very ambitious, yet that challenge must be met. How are those very ambitious? And I think what India has proposed is that during the next 15 years, its forests will sequester three times more carbon than they are sequestering now. Natural forest and the past rates during the 15 years, you know, the rates have continued, <coughs> the, the, the natural forest has continued to decline. So it's not clear what will happen, what are the mechanisms. But again, I, 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 would, I would say, uh, you know, we have to, we have to think about it, and that's more the reason why people have to come together. And uh, certainly these debates and discussions are very important, but I think they are important in the sense, you know, we need to, we need to find ways to move forward in a very, very constructive way. We need to settle some, some of the differences and move on rather than continuing to discuss things over and over and over. And it's my hope that out of this meeting, some very, very concrete action plans will come, come out or some suggestions as to how we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal. The thing is that uh, Kamal was talking about the Northeast, where we are, uh, and there's so much forest, but we're fixing that. They'll be vanishing very fast now. We are talking about 135 large dams, close to <coughs> about 1,000 smaller, smaller impoundments. And uh, we're talking about the largest earthquake-prone zone almost in the world. And uh, basically, it's the East India Company all along. We're not going to give that power to Tezpur. We're sending that to Delhi. So, Raman, you wanted to say something about elephants. You represent the largest... No? Yes, well, it's open to the house now, but somebody will have to run around with the mic. I'm too old for it now. I'm just, uh, you know, in this debate, I'm sort of going back to the... Uh, uh, your opening remarks, Bittu, you know, uh, when you spoke about uh, population and consumption, okay. I think that's really where the oxymoron is, in two sides of, the, of a given coin. And, uh, you know, I think we should continue to, do, you know, make our efforts at the local level, working with communities to achieve conservation, sustainability, you know, clean up our air and all of that. Yeah, but... 
but essentially i think you know at a at a macro global scale i think this issue of population versus consumption is something that we haven't really paid enough attention to uh when you look at consumption uh i mean what as you know even in this meeting before i before the session started you know two or three people told me yes yes you know we need to reduce the human population okay uh now implicit in that is that if you reduce the human population then automatically levels of consumption will go down okay but i would challenge that because all that it means is that fewer people will eventually end up conserve, uh, cons consuming more and more perhaps okay so that's not necessarily just reduction of the population doesn't necessarily translate into redu reduction of consumption it doesn't necessarily translate into uh, you know better environmental governance or you know better environment and, and so, so on so forth professor shu between uh, india and china do you think that no, we'll be we'll able come, to reduce we'll our population we'll come, we'll come i'll come to that i'll come <laughs> to that yeah. now if you look at we will have make it a little quick because yeah, i think we'll we have to yeah. reduce population certainly yeah. or at least ensure that populations do not grow above a certain level yeah. because of their future aspirations of consumption at the same time if you look at levels of consumption are they really justified in terms of human well being now if you look at a graph of consumption versus human well being you know some indicators if you take this is a non linear function you know you you get an increase in <coughs> human well being as we consume more and more but something that asymptotes after a certain level and there are very large number of countries that are beyond that you know where with increasing consumption they are not getting any increased well being human well being so that is what i call totally wasteful i, I would even call it spiteful conservation uh, consumption you know a behavior in some sense on the other uh, hand if you look at population i mean here again i had a little debate uh, discussion with somebody here how do you reduce a human population growth my yeah. question is I, like for this climate change issue is this the changing of lifestyle the top priority or like you know changing the carbon pricing and coming into clean energy the major thing so what is the solution madhu i don't know about solutions but i think this what you are asking is about the way the problem is framed there is there is when when individuals are concerned about the way things are we really would like to frame the problem in such a way that it allows us to respond so often we try to frame that in ways that you know maybe our lifestyle changing our lifestyle could actually make a difference but i think the important i'm not trying to run that down i think it's a very important symbolic act which i think every one of us must contemplate for ourselves but i think i want to make an important distinction that it's the aggregate impacts that are really it's not your red meat consumption that's actually or uh, causing a problem but i think the aggregate production and the and the nature of production and the the that is really what needs to change it's not and by a, uh, a, a an individual act a symbolic act you necessarily do not produce the aggregate change that we need to see so that aggregate change also needs to happen and there i have one point to make which i think is very relevant to people who care about conservation which is that everywhere sukumar mentioned this at a global scale about consumption versus population it's an issue of equity right are we consuming more or are you consuming more if you just count the number of heads we are if you count the number of if you count carbon you are so what we are trying to aspire for is equity and i think essentially in india whether you are trying to frame this globally or you are trying to frame this in local context there's no running away from the fact that environment environmental conservation is an issue of equity and i the the we can hide and we've done that for a long time yeah or we can try and find a back door to this which we've also tried to do but i think if we really have to face up to something that is significant we have to face up to the fact that this is an issue of equity if you are going to protect corridors from people who are trying to scratch a li livelihood and are therefore encroaching our forests and will there be a deafening silence to all the diversions that are happening to large infrastructure and so on we are really not going to get anywhere unless this has to be we can fundamentally question our approach to the issue of conservation as an issue of equity i don't think we're going to make uh, much headway and i th as long and i think that was very implicit in what sonam said yeah it's about how important you want to make the process by which you make decisions as a society and i think if there's equity there 
not in the laws. I think we have fantastic new rhetoric and terrible old habits. Myself, Mustafiz Rahman. Uh, my question is to Mr. Vano uh, Arlu. Oh. No, this person. Oh. I, I mean. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Professor Shu. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking they were interesting the seats. I, I was right. thinking. Uh, means he was talking about uh, using less uh, farmland and uh, less carbon emission. Uh, he was talking uh, about the technology. What kind of technology you were supposed to talking about? Okay, and and, and uh, I think you look at uh, the uh, what's called the uh, oil rice production in past the were triple <coughs> and. Uh, and the same way to double cropping. And uh, so that's a uh, many way, you know. So my dream in the future, our housewife can produce own food in house, not even in the field. So that's my dream. But so look at the Assam rice production and uh, by calculations far below, so, you know, say so actually a uh, year that we can achieve. So that's, I think, uh, uh, okay. your, your turn. Uh, my question be to, uh, Madhu sir and Arup sir, uh, they mentioned about the uh, Delhi smog and environmental uh, air pollution <coughs> issue. Uh, okay, uh, the particulate level has uh, risen after the uh, Diwali. So uh, I have to mention that uh, India's uh, firecracker industry is worth uh, uh, about $2.4 billion. So uh, we can't neglect the economic point of view, no? So what will you... <laughs> I'm being yeah. saved for, for, to have an yeah. interview with someone. Okay. But uh, a couple of observations, uh, just very quickly. So, uh, uh, I don't think there's one solution. Obviously, there are many solutions that have to happen simultaneously at different levels, technological, governance, cultural. You know, Amitiv Ghosh has written a very well-publicized book internationally on climate change. I think it's called The Great Derangement. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it's gotten huge publicity in North America and Europe as well as in India. And of course, he talks about the need for a, 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 the inability of our different global cultures, national cultures and global cultures, to, to, to deal with the collective action and the global actions needed to address cl uh, climate change. But that book itself is, is an important uh, step forward in, in the coming to consciousness of the changes that need to happen. Technology, I thought the, the issue of uh, t technology is very interesting. Now, there is a traditional, I think, again, a false dichotomy. Well, technology will save us. So you don't have to do, uh, don't have to change uh, politics, governance, uh, policy, you know, uh, where somehow we'll, we'll, we'll find a cold, cold fusion will be the new source of energy, so we don't, uh, we don't have to work, invest in uh, uh, subsidize uh, improvements in uh, solar or wind or what have you, and so on. So this is a common false path, which is, uh, uh, but on the other hand, the fact is that technology does continue to evolve. If you, if you look at the history of economic production in the world, going back to the 1920s, in the 1920s, uh, br uh, the United States and, and Britain and, uh, were the, the biggest economies, together with Germany, I suppose, and the, uh, what you see is that, the, yes, lower populations, uh, lower level of uh, gross national product and that kind of thing. But if you look at per dollar, constant dollar uh, of uh, economic product, uh, it was much more resource intensive and uh, intensive and stuff and, and, and energy inefficient incredibly. We wouldn't be able to survive on the planet with a level of uh, uh, GNP per dow constant dollars if we were using, trying to do this with the inefficient technologies of the 1920s. So, so world population has increased greatly, uh, uh, GNP consumerism increased greatly, but there's been a steady progress it continues of economy, every economy becoming more efficient in, uh, in terms of uh, energy efficiency and in terms of uh, use of materials uh, per unit produced. But the problem is, of course, population growth and consumerism. We, we can't separate ourselves totally from the, uh, our material dependence on natural resources. So at some point it has to stop. You know? At some point, there has to be a, a steady state economy, a stabilization. But if you enter into that debate, then you, you hit the whole issue of, redistribu of, of social equity and uh, rather than economic growth evolving problems of power and social and economic inequality, politicians all over the world don't like to talk about redistribution 
or, or taxing the rich more or what have you. They, 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 every politician on earth likes to talk about, well, growth will lift all boats so we don't have to face the issue of uh, dealing with economic power and, and social inequity. But around the world, particularly in the past 25 years, uh, we all know that inequality in almost uh, every country has, has increased, uh, both in the West and developing. You've had a great boom in Asia, but in, in, China, in China, for example, the, uh, the, the social economic inequality has increased the, the, in spite of the great progress that's been made. Uh, in India, you have, a you have a middle class and a consumer class, but the very poorest are left behind uh, to us still. So these are diff So all these things have to happen simultaneously. The part of the sustainability involves social equity and, and, and ec more economic and social justice. Uh, part of it involves technology. Part of it involves a cultural change so that collectively we can all have the ability to uh, uh, reorient things. And, and the, you see the solutions are developing everywhere, but the, in every society there are political blockages, governance blockages, and so on that prevent the uh, uh, quick and necessary widespread uh, adoption of these technologies. And on the climate front, I was saying, there is some good news about how much solar and wind has come down in price. But in India, it's, the solar photovoltaic is now in places like Rajasthan, so it, it's com totally competitive with the new coal plants or, or hydro plants or what have you, you know. This conference, it, it's wonderful. I, 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 I don't know if you can imagine attending a conference like this 20 years ago with this level of consciousness and, and, and intelligence and, and, and experience focused on, on these issues. So I think the, uh, uh, I think solutions will evolve if we, uh, uh, if we realize more fully what the problems are, and some of the questions are, of course, very t tough issues of governance and uh, and so on, which I guess we're going to discuss a bit more tomorrow in the morning session. Okay. Minders, yes, yes, okay, and so minders, I'm happy so that the minder is dragging me out of this, but it's only to go to another look, uh, interview. Under 35, okay. okay. before he Thank goes, very much. Okay. let me translate okay. for you what what we say in India, jiski lati usi ki bhais. Now, you understood, of course, right? <laughs> yes. So basically, it means if I've got a big stick, I own the buffalo. Yeah, okay. So, oh, okay. Yeah, and there's a second one which will be very relevant to us tomorrow. Narahe baas, navaje basuri. So we can keep scrabbling for resources, but yeah. when the bamboo goes, the sound of the flute goes with the bamboo. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought I'd leave yeah. you with that thought and then ask the 35 year olds what you think about Jiski Lati, Yusi okay. Ki Bhais. So At the moment, the Lati is with the Buddha party. Huh? My question is on the background of two aspects, as one is the human wildlife conflict and second one is that Bittu sir said that Diski Lati Uski sir, uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so my question is that the whole way forward from which I got from this panel discussion is that in case of wildlife human conflict, it, it, is, it has two parts. One is the impact of wildlife on population and the second part which is major I think is the people people conflict and which is not getting addressed much by the conservationists in the academic papers and all. Okay, I will get, give two examples, which I am studying right now, that uh, the people in Udalgui district in Assam, okay, they are saying that th th that district is the heaviest, is uh, having heaviest conflict in the world right now, in terms of human death and the elephant death. When I ask the people that, uh, do you think elephant is a problem for you? Said hundred percent respondent of mine said no, elephant is not a problem for, for me. The problem lies with the compensation mechanism. Assam government of government of Assam in 2016 has allotted 35 lakhs for the year 2012-2014 for crop damage and house damage, and each person is get and there are names of 1,064 people in that list. Each people is getting around 3,000 to 4,000 after four or five years. So this is the problem, I think, more than the impact of wildlife on the population. Okay. So and secondly, the and Just secondly. Ask your question so she can respond. You want to. Yeah. I mean, to the question is that. Yeah. yeah. The first question is that why are we not looking into this people people conflict? Are we hiding from it, or do we? Or the conservationist is not addressing this conflict, or they are saying that. This is a social scientist issue. So, is it the right time to, you know, join hands with the social scientist and the natural scientist to 
intervene into this process. Thank you. I think, uh, very briefly, I think you have raised a very pertinent question. Uh, I think, apology to Professor Sukumar, uh, we really don't know about the wildlife and the human relation in the earlier time, right? At least we know very convincingly that even in the earlier times, there are enormous amount of pressure by the wildlife on the humans, right? And there is always a balance. But the issue is that the, when the idea of conservation came up mostly in the 1980s, that it emerged largely out of the scientists, scientific community, biologists, they began to play an important role. They simply tried to ignore this idea of the, the larger political history of a reason, right? This is precisely the political history. And unless and until we know this political conflict, which is deeply embedded to the material history of a region, right? Uh, I don't think we'll be able to understand the conservation politics in a very finer way. I always try to see this is a part of a civilizational process, right? This clearance of forests, clearance of encroachment into the wildlife territory, this is going on for centuries to centuries. This is the only question, the impact. The kind of impact or the kind of impact on the, both on the nature, both on the humans, these are changing over the centuries, over the culture, over the geography. I think this is how we really need to appreciate. But very fortunately, at least in South Asia, I think more and more conservationists, they are paying very finer, closer attentions to the material dimensions of these conflicts. Modu is sitting here, he, he's, he reads history more than me, I think. I think this is a finer example how the conservationists are paying attentions to the social dynamics increasingly. I think India is taking a major lead in this case. At least most of the scientists based in Bangalore, they are really, really into the social science. I think this is a very good science. Thank you. So, yes. Yeah, my question kind of deals with like how India has promised 500 million hectares of forested land in the next 15, 20 years. So, and my question is, is extremely naive, probably to WWF or to the forest officials. So I basically... Five, yeah. Five, exactly. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. So, so my question is basically, I mean, how much uninhabited fertile land do we have in our country? And, and if it's not fertile, how can we make it fertile? And, and like, what, 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 what would be the plans to like have this uninhabited yet fertile land under forest cover? I mean, it's extremely naive, but I actually have no idea. No, it's not and so I, naive. I'd be Let's ask one more question and maybe the answer can come for both of them. Just, just one minute. Ask the other question, maybe we can answer it Okay, together. my question may seem a little obtuse, but I don't think this metaphorical lati that you've spoken about lies with anyone in this room. I think it lies with a very powerful couple, which is global governments married to um, consumer-driven consumer -driven corporates. And therefore, as conservationists, should we be spending much more time lobbying governments for change? Because the solutions already exist. NCF is coming up with sol solutions, WCS is coming up with solutions. It's not that solutions don't exist, it's that we have trouble implementing them or getting them uh, regulated or regularized. I have a very brief answer, that? very brief answer to the yes. first question. Yeah. Assam has 33 million people, 33 million people. Uh, it has 30% of the area under reserve forest in the forest department and beyond that area, beyond that geography of reserve forest, 62% of the land cannot be cultivated. This is unavailable for cultivations in future because either it is wetland, river, barren land, hills or other things. So you can guess the equation. We, we don't, we are, 37 percent of our population don't have access to land or any kind of employment. In fact, just two quick answers to your elephant problem and the plantation thing. Elephant actually, we are really, really seized about this man-animal conflict and this is one of our priorities. And in fact, earlier the process after which the compensation was given was a little longer thing. We've cut it down. It's only our range officer and someone from the revenue person who goes and uh, does the, assesses the damage and it comes to the DFO directly. So I mean, that ch channel is much reduced now, but yes, we have not been able to release the uh, compensation for the past, I mean, what you mentioned. But it's all been done now. In fact, just yesterday, Honorable CM had given the ex-gratia in Tezpur for, for the Sonitpur and Sonitpur East uh, divisions. So we are totally seized of it. And I, I mean, I can assure you we'll get, it, we'll get the backlog done very soon. Then your plantation thing. I mean, we are taking up, uh, I, we, uh, gradually our forest area and trees outside forest is also being calculated under the forest cover now. So that is being, I mean, we, uh, we've got a massive program for conversion of, in fact, we've got three categories of forests, dense, moderate, and open. So gradually we're trying to convert these open forests into better quality forests, and that is where we will get our carbon sequestration uh, targets done. 
And what then is, we've got. What is better quality forest? I mean, the canopy cover. We so categorize it cover, on the. Canopy cover, the World Bank forestry projects have destroyed 30, 40 percent of our forests through monocultures, which are very nicely dense canopies, but they're all. That, there's no biodiversity I mean, in there. We're not doing it in Assam. We, yeah, and if anybody yeah. comes, anybody, no, no, look, I'm that, making that a really blank statement. What was done if anybody cases. comes here and says in 15 years we'll sequester carbon through this, they're, they're talking through their hat. No, no, that was very they're wrong. They're deranged if they think that in 15 years' time we'll bring carbon down because you're talking monocultures which failed no, no, in no, the no, 1970s and 80s. No, no, we're not monocultures in Assam. No, we, we, we've not got monocultures anywhere no, in Assam. No, I'm not talking of the Assam. I'm Maybe saying the MP, solution MP that India done, has put forward. But here we are consciously trying to recreate. We no, cannot I, recreate I a national forest, but we're consciously trying to do a mixed species. It but is how, never a monoculture. You know, Except for areas in Sal, which is Anish, naturally you want to weigh in on mono. this. How is the forest department ever going to plant biodiversity? Is it possible? Anish is a field biologist uh, and he's... No, two things. Anish First, Andheria, a response to you WCT. About, about compensation. When a forest guard died in Manas, protecting the elephant, because of the elephant, there was no compensation given to him. So... Compensation to people to outside. On specifics, no, no, but no, no, no. I'm just, I'm I mean, just trying to say that government is coming with solutions. When but was this? If you can give me the details. I, last year it happened, and Bibuti will give is, you the this details. This is a little also. hard to believe. Bibuti did. Uh, yes, he was. Um, he was the one of, in one of, one camp. He died while doing the patrolling, patrolling duty. Uh, but uh, his family, I, I think, not received the compensation. Anyways, so, yeah. but, no, but that's, that's aside. Yeah, in, 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 Go on, Anish. No. Uh, in addition to that, I just want to put one minute. Uh, <laughs> in, in Assam, compensation amount is very low. low. In, we're trying to, we've, we've got a note prepared state. for hiking it. Yeah, yeah. yeah, we've got that done. Yeah. yeah. In fact, we were in uh, uh, discussion with the insurance companies if they could take it up under crop damage by elephant as a natural damage. So we've been talking to them for years now, but they're not really convinced into this. I don't know why. See, there's one ministry. Also try and answer the question that was yeah. raised on the policy issue. Policy issue. And, and lobbying for policy change. There is yeah, one what? ministry that's supposed to be afforesting our country, and that's the forest department. The only solution they have currently. No, no. Yeah. No, I no, don't no. know that we're going off track. No, I'm the coming to my. This, I'm. Uh, there are two things. Uh, Sukumar, there are two things. Human beings are trying to manage nature and they are not doing a good job of it. That's what the subject is and that's what the oxymoron is. And what the young person under 35 is asking is that instead of arguing amongst ourselves and convincing ourselves, are we doing something to convince policy change? Uh, millions of Indian rupees I think we should are being put on that. afforestation programs. Millions are being drawn, thrown for plantations by the forest department. So all we need is to secure the forest so that the animals and birds plant them. Correct. And that will not happen in 15 years. So we should set goals which are naturally possible. We cannot expedite the processes that the nature, that nature understands. So that's one thing. And India on paper is 21.23% forest, of which we all know only about 5% is about protected areas from the entire land, land area that we have. And say another 6% is good quality. So the answer to all these issues lie in actually making that 21.23% forest, forest. Currently it is not. And good canopy is a myth because canopy doesn't talk about climate change at all. Canopy can be great, but if it is monoculture, it, it's, uh, it cannot provide the kind of sequestration that is required. Um, one-fifth of our country is forested. Most of it is in multiple-use areas. So that brings to all the questions that are going. Unless the community is made equal stakeholder in planning their community land, this is not going to be achieved by any policy. So we have to be very careful when we say sweeping statements. I'm not talking to one person here, but generally, we know where we want to get, we know where we are, but we don't want to invest time in building a strategy. So we will say this is wrong, so we must do, we must empower women. But how are we going to do that in that time before we reach a tipping point is where the 
the actual issue okay, is. I think I we've just sort of run our course. Yeah. We've run, I think we've run our course. We can see this going round and round. Let me just give Sukumar one solution about the problem of population, Sukumar. And I think Madhu and you will understand this more than others. At one level, we are putting persistent organic pollutants into our systems. This is damaging our endocrine system, which is suppressing our immune system. At another level, we have raised temperature and we have raised humidity. The vectors are all changing much faster than we are. I missed Eddie Goldsmith here just now. He, he died some years ago. And he had predicted this exactly the way it is. He says that there will be diseases we don't understand. When I say we, I'm not talking about ministries, I'm talking about your body. You will not recognize the common cold as being something that will finish in five days. So population control will be done the way a dog takes fleas off. That's probably what is going to happen. It doesn't answer Kara's question on policy and what we can do together. But uh, I think if there's anything anybody wants to say, but I think we've got to say it in 30 seconds, or everybody's going to leave from here. <laughs> just, just, yeah. just, 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 a bit, just a couple of things. I mean, yeah, 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 absolutely. I mean, I was just listening to DG Forest day before yesterday. This 2.5 billion to 3 billion tons yeah. would be a sequester. There has been some kind of a calculation in the ministry before we gave those figures. I mean, I think we are responsible enough for that. So let us not. One thing I really personally feel we should not have this blame game happening. I mean, we are all partners. I mean, aren't we focused on one single objective? of making our future generations live in a better world than what we are. So if we can just have that positive attitude of what, uh, I mean, equal partners, not what government does, what government does, everything is not that bad. It's not that bad. They want bad. to drown 120 square kilometers of the Panna Tiger Reserve to get water when the water, the dam doesn't make the water. The forest gives the dam the water, but they want to drown the forest to get the water. Yeah, but that was, that so, was stalled. I mean, that, no, was, that didn't stalled. happen. It's very, very alive. Because my batchment was there. My bad page was no, there. No, it's very alive. The linking, river linking projects the, are very alive. The trees have been marked and they will go ahead with it unless better sense prevails. No, so you see, that was exactly the premise of the FC Act, which is being uh, labeled as a draconian. Sukumar I don't want will to tell you about the FC now. Act and the standing committee. Those things are governed by ministers. They are not governed by experts no, at all. No, but still, there, it, there has been a rationalization of the not diversion of forest land. slightly. We are losing forests faster today than no. during the time of the East India Company. Physical forests. One Subansari... Lower Subansari Dam is a 45-kilometer reservoir. Everything gone. Everything. You talk of Dibang, you talk of the rest. We, we are actually finishing forests faster than the times of the British. And we are still talking of saving it. So I don't know. I wish I could speak so positively. My wife tells me sometimes, I wish you would fight like a normal human being. Why do you fight outside? Fight at home, you know. I, don't, I hate fighting. But I don't see how we are going to solve this anyway, Madhu. I think you conclude this. The elephant in the room is, is, is corporate power and it's capital that's the way it's being brought to bear upon the environment and the, the havoc that's causing. Why don't we petition the government for better policy? I think the short answer to this, I think, is, the, is that what we are seeing is not merely uh, the display of the power of capital. It's the power of capital with the col in, the col in collusion with the state. Yeah. So, you really, I don't think that problem is solved by going to the government. That problem, if anything, I think is really done in the, by building alliances. I think there are common adversaries and there are common uh, uh, yeah, there are allies. And I think in that political process, unfortunately, the, the conservation as it's practiced by conservationists, especially the urban people like myself, has been a very rarefied activity which really doesn't have roots. I think to grow roots, would be a more realistic way of actually being able to take on something like this. Can we all take a deep breath and go? <laughs> Everyone, please join us for dinner <laughs> at the lawn of the, the restaurant here itself. Thank you. <laughs>